Welcome everyone to a new um, a series of our virtual lectures at Tyro. Um, I'm JP Rito, I'm one of the endocrinologists at Mayo Clinic and co-host of this series. So we have um, wonderful speakers today to talk about um, the classification of a thyroid carcinoma in a new grading system. And uh, we have uh, with us Dr. Hussein and Dr. Michael Rivera. But before we start with introduction, I just want to uh, give you a heads up about the World uh, Congress of Thyroid Cancer. It is a virtual series, uh, virtual presentations that start tomorrow. Um, and so you are interested in attending, um, consider linking to this uh, website and uh, subscribed. Um, these are some of the modules in that series. So um, to introduce our speakers today, um, let me start with Dr. Hussein. Uh, Dr. Hussein graduated from Joseph University School of Medicine in Beirut, Lebanon. He completed his residency training in pathology at Boston University and Tufts University in Boston. He trained in the surgical pathology and oncology diseases at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, followed by two years of experimental pathology fellowship. He came on the staff at Memorial immediately after, and he's currently currently the director of the head and neck pathology at Memorial. His research focuses on improving the classification of thyroid carcinoma. And Dr. Hussein is a very well-known researcher in, the, in this field. And you might know him because he was a, a, the corresponding author of the paper about the classification of NIFTIP in JAMA Oncology in 2016. He has also worked on developing um, novel definitions for poorly differentiated type of cancer that actually has changed the practice um, and how we classify poorly differentiated carcinomas. He published many articles on the stratification of encapsulated type of carcinoma into prognostically relevant tumors. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hussein. And then I will just right now proceed with introduce, introducing Dr. Rivera and then Dr. Hussein, you will start. Uh, Dr. Michael Rivera will be our expert discussant today. He was born and raised in New York City. He obtained his medical doctorate at Don State Medical Center in 2001. He completed an anatomic and clinical pathology resident program at Wells Cornet Medical Center in 2005. And from 2005 to 2008, Dr. Rivera completed fellowship in oncology, surgical pathology, cytopathology, and head and neck. Dr. Rivera then went on to become the director of the head and neck pathology at Mount Sinai from 2008 to 2010. And in 2011, he joined the faculty at Mayo Clinic as assistant professor. And now he is the head of the endocrine working group and associate resident program director of an, an, an anatomic pathology. Dr. Rivera is the person to go in my institution in regards to what to do about um, pathology and cytology for thyroid cancer. So thank you very much for both of you. So Dr. Hussein, it is okay. all yours. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right. So uh, before, uh, thank you, Dr. Brito, for this uh, for this introduction. Obviously, very happy to do it with uh, Mike, Dr. Rivera, who was one of her fellows here at Memorial, an outstanding fellow. So before going into uh, the meat of the subject, um, uh, let me just give you a very brief historical background on uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma. So. Yeah, so <clears throat> the, probably the first medullary thyroid carcinoma was reported by the German physician uh, Jacquet in uh, 1906, and he called it malignant uh, goiter uh, with uh, amyloid. Uh, but really, the definite uh, histologic description of medullary thyroid carcinoma was done in 1959 by the Cleveland Clinic pathologist John Beach Hazard and Hawke, uh, with actually the help of for those of you who read the old literature of George Kreil, who was really the well-known uh, thyroid surgeon uh, of the first half of the uh, 20th uh, cent uh, century. A medullary thyroid carcinoma was shown to be a neuroendocrine tumor secreting carcinoma by two pathologists, Peirce from England and Gianni Bisolati from Italy. Actually, this is quite cool. This is one of the first immunofluorescence showing calcitonin in, uh, in uh, C cells. And uh, kind of uh, one of the last chapter of uh, the saga uh, was uh, the discovery that mutation in the red proto-oncogene are kind of the cause of hereditary medullary thyroid carcinoma by two teams in England uh, led by Ponder and uh, in the United States at, uh, I think, Washu uh, uh, led by uh, Donis Keller. Okay, so <clears throat> since that time, since 1959, we have used <clears throat> many prognostic factors to help us stratify patients with uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma, uh, clinical and molecular factors, um, of course, like age, sex, stage, uh, serum CAL calcitonin, 
type of rat mutations, the volume of nodal disease, for example, uh, distant metastasis, of course. Interestingly, uh, uh, there was no attempt to use grade. And this is surprising because medullary thyroid carcinoma is a neuroendocrine tumor and neuroendocrine will have well-established grading system in extrathyroid site. For example, pulmonary and GI neuroendocrine neuroplasts have well-accepted and validated histologic uh, grading uh, system. So there was a gap until uh, 2020 uh, where two group uh, published on the subject. Uh, our group at Memorial published uh, the first article in uh, April uh, 2020, where we graded medullary thyroid carcinoma on the basis of tumor necrosis and high mitotic rate, showing it's an independent predictor of outcome. Uh, but obviously, if you have a good idea, there's somebody else in the world that has it. It happened that Dr. Anthony Gill, uh, who is the well-known endocrine pathologist in Australia, uh, also uh, his group published a few months after us in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology, a grading scheme for medullary thyroid case. Now using the same uh, uh, building uh, uh, blocks. So uh, our <clears throat> Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, grading system is a simple two-tiered approach. Uh, basically, uh, tumor is high grade if it has a high mitotic index, more than five per two square millimeter, and or tumor necrosis. So for low grade tumor, you, have, you need a very low mitotic index and no uh, tumor uh, necrosis. The Sydney system is different. <clears throat> Sorry, it's a three-tiered approach. So you have low grade, intermediate grade and high grade. The low grade uh, are uh, patients with very low mitosis, less than three, a very low KI67 index. They use something different from us and no uh, necrosis. Now the intermediate grade is a mixture of cases with very low mitotic rate, but with necrosis or cases with a high mitotic rate and high KI67 index, but with absent uh, necrosis. And finally, their high grade are those who have high mitotic rate and tumor necrosis or very high mitotic rate, more than uh, 20. Sorry. I'm sorry, I have a problem with my, hopefully, yeah. Sorry guys, just one second. Uh oh. All right, let me see what happened here. Yeah, it's working, sorry. Okay, so let's go back. So um, after uh, uh, these two paper, uh, a paper by uh, Dr. Barletta in Brigham and uh, Women's Hospital uh, validated both system, the Memorial and the Sydney, the, uh, the uh, Australian system in a genotype cohort of sporadic medullary thyroid carcinoma. It was a small uh, cohort, uh, however. So this is great. But the ideal really is to have a universal uh, grading uh, system. And for that, you, have, you need consensus cutoff for all indices. Like you have to agree on the number of mitosis, the number of uh, the KI67 index. And obviously, you need a cohort coming from multiple uh, international uh, centers. So we gathered uh, 327 patients with a resected medullary thyroid carcinoma from Sydney, Australia, led by Dr. Gill, from Institut Gustave Roussy uh, in Villejuif, just outside Paris in France, led by Dr. Guzlan, the memorial uh, series with uh, myself and Dr. Shu and Ansh, uh, uh, cases from the University of Bologna uh, in Italy, led by Giovanni Talini, and cases from Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard uh, by uh, Dr. Justine uh, Barletta. Uh, so the uh, parameters collected were uh, the mitotic count, uh, two square millimeter per uh, hotspot. So we, we went basically for those who are not pathologists in the area with a lot of uh, mitosis. Uh, and we counted the mitosis that in 10 high power field. Uh, the KI67 proliferation index was uh, done uh, by counted 500 to 2,000 cells uh, at the hotspot. That's very similar to what people do with GI neuroendocrine tumor. And of course, we uh, checked whether there is a tumor necrosis 
or not. We also got a large number of other clinical pathologic parameters, for example, post-op serum calcitonin, post-op uh, CEA, <coughs> AJCC uh, prognostic uh, grouping uh, system, of course, and the endpoints were uh, overall survival, uh, disease-specific survival, local regional uh, free uh, survival, and distant metastasis uh, free uh, survival. Oh, again, I have a problem here. All right. Sorry, guys. Again, I don't know what's happening. Okay. All right. Now it's working. <laughs> okay. So, um, in addition uh, to gathering all these cases, all slides were reviewed by expert thyroid pathologists at the participating sites who are blinded to the patient uh, outcome. And mm -hmm. necrosis uh, was just recorded as present or absent, regardless of its uh, extent. So just to show you what necrosis looks like for those who are not pathologists. So basically, it's a, a collection of nuclear debris coming from the medullary carcinoma cells and the inflammatory cells. In some cases, it was easy to spot, like in the upper half photograph here, but in other cases, uh, it was a little bit more subtle. So uh, after we gathered the data, we trialed uh, the memorial system, the Sydney grading uh, system, and eight other potential uh, grading schemes using various cutoffs, we played with the cutoffs, we played with the mitotic index with the KI67. And then after all this data was gathered, a consensus conference was held between all the authors and a single system was agreed upon that we called International Medallary Thyroid Carcinoma Grading System. Just to give you an idea of the, of the study uh, cohort, uh, the median age was uh, 58. Um, the uh, median size was 1.8 centimeter for the tumor. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, approximately 37% of the patient uh, reached a calcitonin doubling time. And when it was reached, it, uh, it was around 13 months. Distant mats at presentation, this metastasis around 9%. And uh, hereditary medullary thyroid carcinoma in approximately 12% uh, of the cases. So this table shows the prognostic value of each parameter by univariate survival analysis. The building blocks of the grading system, like tumor necrosis and mitotic index, were very powerful in each outcome, uh, uh, in each outcome endpoint. Uh, for example, in overall survival disease-specific local regional and distant metastasis free survival, uh, mitosis at three or five. Same thing for the KI67. Obviously, the well-known traditional parameters that we know about, uh, like sex and uh, age and post-op calcitonin and CA, of course, the staging uh, AJCC, the most current AJCC uh, uh, staging grouping system worked also uh, very well in univariate analysis, as well as the calcitonin doubling time for recurrence, uh, local regional and distance metastasis-free survival. Now let's zoom in on these parameter, parameters used to build the grading system. So we, when you look at necrosis, whether any end survival endpoint you use, you see that necrosis is very, very powerful. It really uh, makes uh, the survival much worse when it comes to disease specific local regional recurrence or, um, uh, or uh, distant metastasis free survival. So very, very powerful. Now, when you look at um, the value of the mitotic index and KI67, the first thing you notice that as the mitotic rate increases, as you can see here, uh, the survival worsens. Um, it seemed that the inflection point in the entire cohort is between five and 10 mitosis per 10. Uh, it's, uh, it's between, uh, actually it's no, it's like around five mitosis per 10 high power field. When it comes to those cases without necrosis, um, you can see that uh, really the inflection point is at five mitosis. Those between zero and four do uh, uh, relatively well. And probably more interesting, when you uh, limit your survival analysis to those patients with necrosis, 
even if you don't have any mitosis, necrosis really puts you in a bad category, so to speak. The same uh, really trends uh, were seen for the KI67 proliferation index. So as it increases, as it gets worse with the inflection point between 5% and 10%. And when you don't have any necrosis, it's around uh, 10%. But again, here is the same story. If you have necrosis, uh, even if you have a very low KI67 index, the tumor is going to behave aggressively clearly showing that uh, mitosis and KI67 seems to be less prognostically relevant uh, than necrosis. And that means that tumor necrosis should be definitely captured in any grading system for medullary thyroid carcinoma. Another interesting observation that will be of great interest to pathologists is that we, we didn't have in a cohort of 327 cases from different countries, we didn't have a single patient who had a mitotic index more than 20. And for us pathology is important because this is the cutoff that is used in a grade three gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumor, what I say, GI, what I put as GI net and ET here, showing that it's very difficult to use, uh, for example, the system that is utilized in the GI neuroendocrine tumor for uh, for medullary carcinoma. Same thing if you use the mitotic cutoff for pulmonary neuroendocrine tumors, uh, which is 10 mitosis per two square millimeters, only 2% of our cases met uh, this mitotic index. Same story for the KI67. If you uh, use the 20% KI67 proliferation index, only 3.4% of the cases uh, met uh, this KI67 proliferating, proliferation index. So now let's uh, look at uh, the trial of uh, these various uh, grading systems. All right, so first we tried to evaluate the two tiered uh, grading uh, systems, basically those that will put the patient into either a low grade or a high grade category. First, we use our memorial grading system, and the cutoff is less than five mitosis per 10 high power field and no tumor necrosis for low grade. And uh, for mitosis and or tumor necrosis, and uh, uh, for low grade, sorry, for high grade, you need more than five mitosis and or tumor necrosis. So we also use this Australian system here. We collapse intermediate and, uh, and, uh, high, and high grade. So basically low grade is less than three mitosis, KI67 less than 3% and no tumor necrosis. And high grade is anything that is above that. Here, it's a quite an interesting grading system because it's exactly the one we use at Memorial, five mitosis cutoff, K, uh, no tumor necrosis for low grade, but also a KI67 less than 5%. In this grading system, uh, we use the cutoff that are used in pulmonary uh, neuroendocrine uh, uh, tumors, uh, for example, the two mitosis for the low grade, but we add a tumor necrosis that is not uh, 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 automatically added in this system. And so um, finally, I guess maybe the most interesting system is this one, uh, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the cutoff that is used for the GI neuroendocrine tumor, but without using necrosis as a, as a parameter. So let's see how this uh, two-tiered grading system did. Actually, all of them did relatively well, but when you uh, look at the data in multivariate analysis, you start to see that the grading system that I'm putting here, scheme four, that does not include necrosis uh, at all uh, in its uh, parameters, loses uh, independent prognostic value for disease-specific survival and the other, and, and recurrence-free survival. Now, the other uh, grading uh, system that include necrosis uh, still survive multivariate analysis, but if you look at the three and two mitosis cutoff, they capture too many, uh, too many uh, cases uh, with, uh, uh, as high grade, 40% or more as high grade. So now this is a much more complicated slide. Here we tried to assay a, a three-tiered grading system. So low grade, intermediate grade, and high grade. Uh, we first use the Sydney grading system where low grade is low mitotic rate, low KI67, no tumor necrosis. 
and the intermediate uh, grades are those who have a low mitotic index and tumor necrosis or high mitotic index without tumor necrosis. And here again, we, so to speak, played uh, with, the, with the numbers. Uh, for example, in this uh, three-tiered grading system, we use the cutoff used is in neuroendocrine, uh, lung tumors. Uh, we use two and 10 mitosis, but we added uh, a KI-67, uh, which is not usual, usually in pulmonary neuroendocrine system. In this system, we restricted uh, high uh, necrosis uh, to high-grade tumors in a sense that intermediate grade did not contain uh, necrosis. Here also is uh, another variation using the GI neuroendocrine system. And here is another scheme that interesting to look at. This is a scheme where the intermediate grade have, as I said for the other one, no necrosis. So necrosis is again restricted only to the high grade. So let's see how this system uh, did this three-tiered grading system. I mean, the first thing that is interesting, so those systems that uh, restrict necrosis to high grade, basically where intermediate grade has no necrosis, well, then intermediate grade loses its prognostic value. So basically, it, the curve is very, it collapses with low grade, this grading system and this grading system. Those grading system that include necrosis in the intermediate grade, they uh, survive <coughs> um, uh, multivariate analysis and actually they separate between low grade and intermediate grade and between intermediate grade and high grade. However, that's here the rub. If you put necrosis in the intermediate grade, you start to have two subpopulations with different outcome. Those with low mitosis and tumor necrosis, where there is a significant number of patients who died of disease, and those with high mitosis but without tumor necrosis when the tumor is not as aggressive. And here I see a problem for selecting patients for clinical trial. Then you will have to split the intermediate grade, which will make uh, the situation very difficult for oncologists who are trying to develop uh, uh, adjuvant therapy in clinical trial. So what is the basis of our choice of this consensus grading system? So what decisions did we take? The first, we used a two-tiered grading system, low grade and high grade. And the reason for that are, one, the lack of prognostic value of intermediate grade, especially when necrosis is excluded. Simply the fact that two-tiered grading system is uh, more simple than a three-tiered grading system. As I showed in the beginning of this presentation, the rarity of uh, medullary carcinoma in meeting uh, very high mitotic and KI67 cutoffs that I used in a three-tiered grading system, like in the gastrointestinal neuroendocrine system. Now, why did we use five and not three mitosis, for example, or two mitosis? Well, the reason is because the cutoff of three mitosis or two mitosis captured too many tumor as high grade. We thought that was not really reasonable. So we use, that's why we use the five mitosis cutoff. Now, why did we add KI67? I have to be honest, I was not so much keen about it. I didn't think that it has that many added value, but I was convinced by, by other colleagues because you can use KI67 as a check for mitosis. Because uh, as uh, Dr. Rivai will tell you, who is by the way, an expert in counting mitosis when he was a fellow here, um, the, it's, uh, there is a significant amount of inter observer variability in identifying mitosis between uh, pathologists. Also in some instances, the fixation, the way the specimen is handled can really diminish artif artifactually the number of mitosis. And finally, uh, we accepted that because it's more in sync with, with what other pathologists are doing in other neuroendocrine tumors, like the GI, where they use KI67, so a kind of political uh, pressure uh, here. But there is a push, uh, and we saw it in the DAS uh, World Health Organization uh, meeting in the upcoming WHO fascicle on uh, uh, endocrine tumors that for a universal uh, grading system for all neuroendocrine tumors, at least to use the same uh, building block parameters. So finally, we uh, got this grading system, the International Medullary Thyroid Carcinoma Grading System, that uh, a tumor would be considered high grade if it had at least one of the following criteria, 
a mitotic index of five or more mitosis per two square millimeter, a KI67 proliferative index of more uh, than 5%, uh, equal or more, or tumor necrosis. Now, an important point here that the pathologist should, uh, should uh, put in his or her report the exact number of mitosis and KI67, since this is a continuous variable. And as I showed you, as the mitotic rate goes up, the prognosis uh, worsens. So this is an important uh, parameter to put as a continuous variable. So here are the survival curves from <coughs> this uh, grading system. As you can see in every uh, endpoint, there is a significant difference between low grade and high grade. And if you bring, want to bring this more to life, so to speak, just to give you an idea, uh, if you use that system, the 10 year disease specific, post specific survival in low grade will be 97% and it dropped to 53% at 10 years using this grading system. For distant metastasis free survival, the grading, the low grade are 84% at 10 years and it drops to 31% at, at 10 years using this uh, grading uh, system. And when we did the subgroup analysis, the prognostic significance of consensus grading for was maintained in each participating site for overall survival, disease-specific survival, and distant metastasis-free survival. Um, and uh, it was also preserved in local region of free survival, except a little hiccup here in the Italian study where it didn't make it to significance, just borderline significance. So of course, we did a multivariate uh, analysis and uh, this grading system uh, in the entire cohort for every endpoint. Again, I'm repeating myself, whether it's overall disease specific, distant metastasis or local regional free survival is independent from sex, tumor size, post-op CEA and calcitonin, the AJCC age prognostic grouping system um, and other items like age uh, margins and uh, vascular in, uh, invasion and red germline mutation, red germline. So kind of the big problem, the whole in this study, we'll see if Mike will talk about it, is that we didn't correlate sporadic mutation and grade. We didn't have uh, the data. Although before this paper was published, one paper published by Dr. Barletta, our colleague um, uh, in 2021 showed uh, that in her genotype cohort, which are 44 cases, not many, there was no correlation between uh, genotype, the type of red mutation, for example, and uh, the grade of the sporadic medullary uh, thyroid carcinoma. But I can tell you the answer is coming soon. We at Memorial Genotype, our uh, cases, we're going through the data, the French group led by Dr. Guzlan Genotype, their data. And I think, uh, if I'm not sure, I, I think there is no correlation with grade, but we will see. So what, what this is for, uh, what are the potential benefit of all uh, this uh, work? is hopefully this will help stratify patients for early lateral neck dissection. You will better follow up those with high grade. You have low threshold for cross-sectional imaging in this patient. And obviously if you have high grade, um, a physician should do everything in his or her uh, power to do a very good careful workup for distant metastasis. As, as I said a few slides earlier, we hope high grade uh, will be a data point for clinical trial because those with high grade are the ones that are most likely to benefit uh, from uh, adjuvant uh, therapy. And that's uh, the end of the talk. And thank you very much. I can unshare. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gossain. Um, as a just historical point, I, I was his uh, fellow in Memorial Sloan Kettering. So I owe um, much of my endocrine knowledge to Dr. Hussein for uh, whom I'm eternally grateful for. Um, so I'm gonna be uh, just describing a little bit of the history and uh, the article uh, that he, uh, I'll start screen sharing in a moment. and maybe give a little bit historical perspective, a little bit like uh, Dr. Gossain did as well. I'm just gonna move this away here. 
So I'm going to be talking about the IMTGS system, but also I'll just talk a little bit about what's led up to that point and a little bit of the history, historical context, as, as Dr. Gutsane did as well. Uh, I have no disclosures. So there are traditional factors that are known to influence the prognosis of medullary thyroid carcinoma. Many of these were mentioned already, TNM stage, prognostication category, age, hereditary versus sporadic disease, calcitonin CA levels, presence of vascular invasion, Rhett mutation status. These are, are well-known uh, features. What's uh, maybe not as well-known to, to some in, in the clinical audience that KI67 has also uh, been shown to be prognostically influential, but it never really developed over the years. And, that, and I think that's uh, also, like Dr. Hussain, a little bit surprising because there was some evidence out there, but no one really followed up with it for, for a very long time. So I'm just going to show a couple of examples here. Uh, the titles and the articles on, on the top here. In this group, uh, Tissell and colleagues, they published a, 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 uh, an article in the British Journal of Cancer in which he looked at a small number of patients uh, with uh, a fairly good follow-up of, of 15 years, looking at primary and metastatic disease, and looked at the KI67 index of these tumors. And he found some interesting things, uh, that the primary tumor supposed to have had lower indices than the first metastasis presented or the recurrent metastasis. So you saw progression in the KI67 as the patient progressed in disease and recurrent metastasis occurred. And uh, primary tumors that metastasized showed a KI67 of 1.05 1, of 1 compared to 0.25 of the primary tumors without metastases. So those with met metastatic disease had much higher proliferation indices than those without metastatic diseases. And then he built these interesting uh, Poisson regression models which uh, even though based on a small number of cases uh, when fixed with age, you can show or basically predict uh, what the median survival would be at various proliferation levels for uh, given age groups. But what, what became of this? Uh, nothing really. Uh, after the study was done in 2003, there was no follow-up studies done by this group. And so there was no formalized grading system ever suggested. In uh, this uh, study that actually had a more imaging uh, focus, it was more about pet imaging uh, and, and catching metastatic disease and trying to find ways in which to catch metastatic disease early in patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma. One thing that they found was that a high KI67 score of more than 2.0% correlated with a metastasis that would be pet avid. And they advocated that the primary tumor had a certain KI67 proliferation level that those patients should be followed with PET because you can capture those metastases more easily. Again, going along with the idea of proliferation being linked to prognosis, and in this particular case, metabolic activity in metastatic disease. And this study produced in the uh, European Journal of Endocrinology in 2011, this is getting a little bit more recent, they looked at KI67 combined with RET expression analysis. And what they found was that KI67 expression was significantly higher in and MTCs that had extrathyroidal extension, lymph node metastasis, distant metastasis, they had a different system of, of, of correlating or showing the number of cells positive, actually counting number of cells per millimeter square and not expressing it as a percentage, why it shows up a little bit differently rather than percentage, it's 25 cells per millimeter squared. Or in this case, uh, the risk of death was elevated if you had more than 50 cells per millimeter squared. All this is kind of like going around and skirting around the issue that grading is important in the prognosis of medullary thyroid carcinoma, but vis-a-vis -vis KI67 proliferation index alone. Uh, in this particular study, uh, they did show uh, that patients with somatic rep mutations had higher KI67 levels. That's interesting because as Dr. Gossain uh, mentioned in a more recent report, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between grade and the rep mutation uh, status, but again, I, I think that needs to be explored further. It looks like the memorial group is, is doing that. So moving on to the uh, ITM uh, uh, GS uh, system, the International Medullary Thyroid Carcinoma Grading System, was a very carefully done study, in my opinion, uh, a very well done study. Uh, 327 cases looked at across five institutions, a median follow-up of, of 55 months for 322 patients. Microscopic examination was quite detailed with a focus on invasive features. Cytologic nuclear features were not examined. And as a cytologist, you know, you might take umbrage to that, but I don't, honestly, because the previous studies that looked at cytology 
were not very, did not show a lot of utility to the cyto cytologic features in terms of prognosis. And part of the reason of that is, is when you're looking at pure cytology features like nuclear size, size of nucleoli, uh, medullary thyroid carcinomas in general tend to show a lot of uh, uh, a, a, a lot of polymorphic cytologic features in general. And so uh, e even in a classic cytologic diagnosis, you say if you have cells that have small nuclei, large macronuclei and multinucleated cells in a smear to think of medullary thyroid carcinoma. And another word of saying that is pleomorphism, right? So pleomorphism already built into the diagnosis of medullary thyroid carcinoma, irrespective of rate, it seems. So at least from the standpoint of nuclear size per se, uh, would not be predictive. Uh, they had uh, a number of cases well represented across the stages. There was a little bit more towards the stage one and stage four cases, a little bit less in the middle. And that might explain some of the stats that showed up with not all the features showing uh, multivariate independent significance for, for stage, but still uh, a very good numbering of cases. And then they graded uh, using the IMTGS consensus criteria, which are, as Dr. Gossain explained, having mitosis greater than equal than five per two millimeter square, which is roughly about 10 high power fields on most standard Olympus microscopes, a KI67 proliferation index of greater five than 5%. This was not done by image analysis. And that's something that I'll, I'll mention again later. And the presence of uh, tumor necrosis. Now, uh, as Dr. Hussain also explained in great detail, this represents a consensus of a number of grading uh, systems looked at. One was the previously published Memorial Stone Kettering data, uh, which uh, focused on mitotic activity and the presence or absence of necrosis, and the Sydney system, which include the KI67 proliferation indexes. But uh, they also included a number of other systems. You showed, uh, I think, eight other additional systems that were included. Some of these uh, showing uh, similarity to the pulmonary system of grading tumors. Some of them seem to show a lot of similarity to the GNET system of grading of tumors or permutations thereof. But what I think was interesting when they settled upon uh, the criteria of greater than five mitosis and the presence of necrosis, the thing that struck me the most was just the power of necrosis. And this is not something that's unusual in thyroid cancer disease. We also see this in the diagnosis of polydifferentiated thyroid carcinoma, for instance, necrosis being extremely uh, strong prognostic signal of aggressive behavior in those tumors where despite whatever level of mitotic activity you saw in this particular case, uh, necrosis made it much worse and the same with proliferation. So I'm not gonna spend more time now because Dr. Gossain explained it very well, but I think that's a very Im impressive finding the power of necrosis in that situation. So other features examined included age, sex, post-operative CEA levels, post-operative calcitonin levels, the prognostic grouping according to AGCC, presence of distant METs, red germline mutation, and external beam radiotherapy. Uh, pathologic features considered were vascular invasion, microscopic ectothyroid extension, resection margin status, tumor necrosis, and the grading features as we already discussed. And he already showed you the, uh, Dr. Hussain already showed you the uh, features of, uh, that were significant on univariate analysis, but you can see how well uh, the grading features performed, especially uh, the IMT uh, uh, CGS system. And among the other uh, clinical parameters, the thing that performed the best was the AJCC uh, grouping. However, on multivariate analysis, it's the only factor that maintained its significance across OS, uh, disease-specific survival, uh, uh, this metastasis-free survival, and local regional recurrent-free survival was the grading criteria by the AMTGS. Uh, other factors that maintained uh, significance on multivariate analysis did so, but not for all the factors or, or endpoints measured across the board. The closest one though was the AGC prognostic group stage, which the only place it fell short was on the disease specific survival, but on overall survival, distant metastasis free survival and local regional recurrence free survival uh, performed significantly on, on multivariate analysis. So I, I think when, when you put all those things together, yes, there are other factors uh, that it co-migrates with in terms of the grade, seems to correlate a lot with the staging criteria, but overall the data st strongly supports, uh, in my opinion, uh, the uh, reporting of grade as uh, part of the diagnostic reporting for medullary thyroid carcinoma, and it does show problems in guiding management and selecting patients for specific treatment strategies. Some of the questions that came up in my mind as I was reading uh, through the paper 
is that uh, as a pathologist, I would like to have seen, and maybe clinicians would be interested as well, how many of the stage one cases that were high grade performed aggressively and how aggressively did they perform? And in other words, yes, it was independently significant on multivariate analysis in terms of grade, but in that specific cohort, how many of the low stage cases had high grade features and also performed poorly, um, had uh, recurrence, metastasis, or died of disease? Uh, I think that would be very useful to know about. And also from a clinical standpoint, uh, very important because then the grade becomes more actionable in terms of aggressive therapy if, it, if it's uh, more uncoupled from the HACC uh, staging criteria. And all, and all the organ systems, digital image analysis has proven to be more reproducible and more accurate uh, in GNETs. This has been shown through. There are actually studies comparing mitotic counts by eye and, and uh, or KI, looking at KI67 proliferation by eye and, and, and how the uh, computer systems perform. And computers are just generally superior in, in this regard. Um, so would not prove true for MTC. And if it does prove true, might it affect the cutoffs that you use in terms of prognosis because the, the results may not be exactly what the human eye produces or might it actually produce an intermediate category? Would it establish a more consistent intermediate category if you had uh, digital image analysis being applied uh, to looking at proliferation? And then, and then finally, uh, and Dr. Hussain already mentioned this in the end, uh, previous studies have shown that reputation status does correlate with prognosis. Uh, the, uh, the codon 16918 uh, mutation in particular in MEN2B uh, is known to be more aggressive phenotype and those sporadic cases also have a more ag aggressive disease traditionally, but it didn't seem to correlate with grade, uh, at least by this one study. And so does that mean that mutation status is giving different prognostic information on a, on a different level, albeit maybe somewhat related, but uncoupled to a certain extent from grade? Or is it the fact that RET alone is not what's really the issue here? Uh, just like with papillary thyroid carcinoma, BRAF mutation was uh, thought to be uh, associated with more aggressive PTCs, and, and indeed it is in general, but it's also a, quite a common mutation in PTCs, right? And so uh, in, in the case of like tall cells, those tall cells that behave more aggressively tend to have BRAF plus something else like TERT mutation, uh, uh, for instance. So you wonder if there might be other abnormalities in medullary thyroid carcinoma uh, aside from RET that might actually combine with grade, correlate more strongly, and actually give more guidance to clinicians in terms of which patients will be selected for targeted therapies and so forth, or which patients uh, might be amenable to more aggressive surgery upfront, uh, prophylactic neck dissections and so forth. So overall, I, I think it's wonderful work, strong work, and uh, I think it should be adapted into uh, common everyday pathology practice for medullary thyroid carcinoma. Thank you. Um, fantastic presentation, Dr. Rivera and Dr. Hussein. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Hussein, um, there is already a question from the audience that builds on Dr. Rivera's question in regards to what is the precedent, what takes precedent um, over the, whether the, the ACGG system versus the grading system. I think building on the idea that what happens when you have a low grade, a low tumor, a low uh, stage tumor, and then you have a high risk, a high grade. Yeah. So, <clears throat> as Mike said, uh, uh, and he showed it well, and that stage and actually is important, and grade is important, and they are um, really uh, independent from each other. Now, um, we, we have a, a paper, uh, I mean, the, actually the surgical group has a paper, but we're helping it with it, where actually they restricted uh, their analysis uh, to patient without distant metastasis presentation, Mike, and uh, actually grade uh, was quite, uh, quite powerful and mm -hmm. even uh, superior to calcitonin doubling time that we could not do here because we didn't have many much uh, uh, doubling time. So actually, yeah, I think it, they are really independent from each other. And in low stage, I think uh, it, will be, uh, it will be helpful. Now, I don't know in those uh, who are completely excised without lymph node metastasis, we'll have to, to do the analysis in, in that group. But definitely those without distant metastasis, because a lot of oncologists believe that, of course, and they're right, that medullary with distant metastasis is another beast at presentation than those without distant metastasis. 
And uh, building on, on that idea, um, just out of curiosity, uh, uh, can you do this grading based on frozen, on frozen analysis or uh, oh, no? no? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, if you had necrosis and you can tell that it was necrosis, I mean, that's what we're saying those, but if you could tell that like, it was obvious necrosis, in some cases you can see mites pop on, on, on frozen section, but generally it's a pretty difficult process, not just in endocrine, but in all tumor systems mm. to grade very uh, well on frozen section. Yeah, I agree with Mike. Uh, furthermore, uh, just for the clinicians, I'm sure Mike's know it, but this is nothing, not uh, not something you can do, unfortunately, on a core biopsy. Of course, an FNA. Uh, we, uh, I don't know the value of this grading system in distant metastasis one day, one day. but uh, the reason we cannot do it on a core biopsy, for example, or is because um, necrosis can be focal, as Mike knows uh, very well. So you need actually also, you need uh, for your pathologist to sample the, the tumor quite well. Mm. And uh, in most places now, it's sampled quite well. And, and um, how many times do you find, uh, I guess, a different level of expertise, having necrosis be confused with the needle tract and the necrosis that the needle tract, you know, makes in the tissue? Is, is that something, a, a, a typical... Mistake. Yeah, Mike, you want to answer this one? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, this is something I, I see more in, in, in consultation experience because we get quite a few cases from the outside. And uh, one of the common things, uh, diagnostic errors, as, as it were, is mistaking FNA necrosis for a true tumor necrosis. And uh, a trained pathologist, if you with, with adequate training, and, and the paper in the uh, consensus paper describes quite well, and as, the, as uh, Dr. Gossain's original. A grading paper just based on mitotic counts and necrosis shows that there are differences, uh, generally speaking, between FNA necrosis and true tumor necrosis. Uh, FNA necrosis produ uh, frequently produces a needle track uh, or signs of a needle track in association on the histology section. So you'll see a zone of like granulation tissue like fibrosis, some acute inflammation, some hemocytin laden macrophages, uh, a band of fibrosis extending out from the area that, that's in question. That's usually our, our, our telltale signs you're dealing with an FNA tract, whereas tumor necrosis is, tends to be more abrupt and comedo like. Uh, this is not going to make a lot of sense for a lot of the clinicians in the audience, but it looks like comedo DCIS in, in the breast, where you have abrupt zones of necrosis with adjacent intact tumor, with maybe just a little bit of clear cell change and karyorectic nuclear debris, but without the granulation fibrotic tissue reaction that you would see in FNA. So it is possible to tell in the majority of the cases the difference between the two. There are some challenging cases. But yes, there are pathologists who don't know that difference and, and sometimes mistake FNA necrosis for mm -hmm. necrosis. I just want to jump in uh, uh, one. I say one more thing. Um, this is not a study, but my experience, uh, Mike, can, that, uh, and this is important for the clinician, that most pathologists who work in smaller hospital um, do have a problem differentiating between FNA-induced necrosis and tumor necrosis. In my experience, they miss tumor necrosis. And this is because uh, where um, a large generation of pathologists was trained, including even Mike, not to really look for tumor necrosis in, in thyroid. It was not something like really uh, we're trained to look at like in the lung and so forth. So um, one has to be, uh, to be careful. Hopefully with these papers, uh, this will be... Uh... Hey, and... and... I was very impressed about the prognostic uh, effect of necrosis in comparison with the other two factors. Um, given that uh, strong association, does it make sense to proceed with proliferation of mitotic activity once one finds necrosis? Does it make ah. sense to continue? Ah, that's a very good question. Yeah, in, um, as an, alg in an algorithmic sense. Like, yeah, so I'm saying you, you have a unicrosis. Do you have to go and spend? I'm not sure the time that it, these resources that they need, but it yeah. seems that necrosis is so powerful here that I, I I always look at. I mean, speaking for myself, I always look at both. Uh, the reason why I do is because, generally speaking, aside from the issues of like sampling and that mitotic activity can be in hot spots sometimes. But generally speaking, high mitotic rates, in my experience, do correlate with the presence of necrosis. So usually when necrosis is present, high mitotic rates are usually present. Uh, that's been my, my personal experience, at least. But of course, that, that depends a lot on sampling. And that's why I think necrosis can outperform mitosis or KI-67 in some cases, because uh, in, in tumors where only limited sampling was performed, if you only have necrosis, but you don't see the hotspot of the mitotic activity, then necrosis would tend to trump. 
right? In, in that situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's an interesting question. I don't know what you think about that, Dr. Hussain, but I, I mean, personally, I, I reflexively look at both. Uh, so I, I don't look at one versus the other. I'm always looking at both. Uh, obviously, in an academic center like us or Mayo, since we are very interested in this tumor, we look uh, uh, for, uh, for both. Um, but if you can see, it probably has some additive value, uh, although, of course, as you said, it's much more powerful than mitosis. It's interesting you say that, Juan, because a lot of general pathologists don't like to count mitosis, so it would be very popular in a lot of... <laughs> please don't say that. <laughs> so they would jump on it, and because they're very... Uh, uh, they really don't like to, to look for, uh, for mitosis. It takes time. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that I was thinking is it, yeah. So tell us more about that because for, uh, when you say counting, we uh, from the clinician perspective, we have no idea what that means in terms of time, resources. I imagine that for busy pathologies, this again, this might be difficult to implement in the current setting. So, yeah. can you expand more on what this means in regards to the resources? Um. I can take this one. Well, no, I mean, it just, uh, it takes simply a little bit of time. Now, uh, one thing which is interesting is uh, one question, one person could ask uh, the value, Mike, of doing KI-67, uh, because uh, that you lose one more day, it's an immunostain, and maybe in very poor country, you may not have it. Uh, I just want to say that KI-67 changed the grade in 5 to 10% of the cases, so it's still mm -hmm. Worth it, uh, uh, worth it to do it. No, I'm counting mitosis, you know, it's done in many other tumors, uh, uh, you know, in uh, uterine, uh, uh, smooth muscle tumor of the, uh, the uterus. Mm -hmm. I don't think endocrine hedonic pathology should be lazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, I agree, especially if it's going to impact uh, patient care, which I, I think it very well could as the grading system moves forward in, in a beneficial way, it should be done. But uh, counting mitoses is a laborious task. It does take a long time to do it. And it's more than just uh, being a pathologist and knowing pattern recognition in terms of making the diagnosis. It's almost like a different level of, that I tell residents, almost like Zen meditation when you're counting mitoses because you really have to have an eye for noticing them on the slide. And I, I've been in many situations where uh, uh, pathologists or colleagues of mine will, will show me a case and say, oh, like for an adrenal tumor. Uh, this is how many mitosis I got towards the Weiss criteria. Then you recount it, spend a little bit of time, find twice or three times the number of mitoses. And it's, it's just really just a matter of like being attuned and knowing what to look for and knowing what the mitotic figures look like sometimes. And in different tumors, it can even look a little bit different. So for instance, in polydifferentiated thyroid carcinoma, this is not the topic, but mitoses tend to look a little bit smaller and shrunken down compared to what an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma look like. So you kind of have mm. to stare a little bit more for them uh, to notice them. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of practice uh, to get good at it, which is why digital image analysis may be the way to go moving forward in the future, to be and honest. AI, uh, and yeah. artificial and AI, intelligence. Yeah. This is, uh, I'm sure pathologists will uh, uh, be very happy if AI can uh, uh, <laughs> yes. save us the time for looking at so the, the exact, the, that was my thought is I would imagine that inter and intra uh, uh, re assessment reliability in regards to the agreement in between and within is, is poor is poor i guess for these ah. uh, mitotic counts is that correct yeah. yeah if i can take this one mike <clears throat> so uh, the, so you bring the issue which uh, should be brought of reproducibility there was a poster at the last pathology meeting and it's it's uh, the paper has been submitted not by us but dr Belletta from brigham and woman where there was very good reproducibility but this was within the same academic center brigham and mm. women's hospital which has uh, very well trained pathologists, but the pathologists that looked at it were not all uh, head and neck pathologists. So, but yeah, reproducibility gonna be <coughs> uh, will have to be to be tested. I just want to tell you that there are many uh, groups that are uh, validating that system again, and they are trying to check reproducibility. So, there are a lot of, of papers. We, we, hopefully, it will it will be uh, there will be good news. And so, uh, Mike, you, you mentioned now. Um digital pathology, AI, uh, uh, is something already happening in that area? In, in well, having... I mean, digital path is moving forward at okay. different centers at different rates. I mean, I mean, speaking for what we're doing here now, um, the sign out is occurring digitally on like 60% of the cases now of our in-house cases. Everything is scanned. 
Uh, there are a lot of partnerships with AI in, in, in private industry uh, that is being performed here, heuristic algorithms, AI self-learning algorithms. And that's certainly something that I think could be applied to thyroid and medullary, but other tumors, especially when it comes to, to grade. But it's, not, it's, it, but it's not as easy as it always sounds, right? It always sounds like, oh, computers can do a lot better. AI is a lot smarter. Mm -hmm. But you have to train an AI mm -hmm. and uh, training and uh, uh, algorithms about spatial relationships and recognizing things as they are, as a human eye would recognize it. It's, it's still not uh, all there in certain situations. Uh, so, for instance, I, I, I did an AI algorithm for inflammatory cells in tumor infiltrating lymphocytes just recently, validating for oral pharyngeal car carcinomas and looking at a number of algorithms that the AI is doing. And you'd be surprised how much it misses compared to just a human being being recognizing it in conjunction with the morphology because it's following a, cer a certain set of rules. So unless you have a certain and a very advanced heuristic algorithms, which most people don't have available because it requires monumental resources to bring that to bear, uh, the more modest systems that are being utilized are, are systems which you train and those are trained according to certain rules. But when uh, the computer runs into just like a human being does into areas that are borderline, a computer sometimes doesn't know what to do with that, so it makes judgments. But their judgments tend to be in the orders of magnitude worse in terms of error than human judgments are, because we're more nuanced and take multiple things into account, even though we don't realize we're doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the AI can't do that because it's only trained to do what it can do. And, and so I, I think AI bears a lot of importance for the future, but it's gonna take a little bit to get there in terms of accuracy. Now, in terms of precision, just reproducibility, that's always going to be better than humans because yep, it's yep, yep. the same way every single time. So if you establish a grading criteria, let's say by KI67, even if it's making mistakes in terms of accuracy, if it's precise and you line it up with clinical categories, yeah, the cutoffs are going to look different. It may not be accurate, but it's going to be very precise and reproducible. So does it matter that it's not accurate in certain situations is, uh, is the question essentially as long as it's precise. Yeah, and I just want to add one little thing. In our field, the one uh, thyroid, because it's not a common tumor like prostate or breast, the companies are not that much interested. Uh, I don't know, <clears throat> Mike can say, but I was not uh, approached uh, by, and they know us very well, by any companies to develop something for thyroid, you know, <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, it's not a big money maker really. It's yeah. much better to use something for prostate, for example, and or skin or, you know, yeah, unfortunately, thyroid um, does, yeah, does have that kind of uh, special place where it, 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 it's not impacting the number of people that breast cancer does or lung cancer or colon cancer. So most of the AI companies are interested in those areas. So that, that is true. Um, uh, one last question. Uh, the mutation with uh, the grading, it seems that there is no association. What about the grading with imaging phenotyping, for instance, PETs? Oh, F, F dopa. So, is anything in that way? I don't know. That's a very good question. Actually, <laughs> you gave us an idea to do <laughs> more work. Yeah, actually, that will be a very, uh, very, very uh, interesting uh, uh, to see. Uh, now, PET in medullary casino, not always it's positive, as you know. So, yep. but it, it will definitely be uh, be be interesting to uh, to, mm -hmm. to 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 study this. Yeah. Well, uh, we're at the end of our, our, your presentation. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent presentations. Um, well, I would like just to extend my gratitude to both of you and to the audience for attendance. Uh, we have uh, two more board next week uh, with Mike Total um, and Dr. Harris presenting the cases. Thank you very much for your time. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Juan. Bye, Mike. Bye-bye. Take bye. care. Thank you. Bye.